Hello everyone, this is Gabriel Martins and you're listening to Feel the Pedal Podcast. And today we are talking about relative energy deficiency in sport, the so-called red ass and eating disorders in cyclists and other endurance athletes as well. For that, I'm bringing you today two of my dear nutritionist colleagues from Portugal who have developed a particular interest in this topic. They are Rita Giro and Helena Trigueiro. So let's get the show on the road. Welcome to Feel the Pedal Podcast. Welcome back to Fill the Pedal Podcast. Thank you for being on that side as a faithful listener. Today is episode 27 of the podcast and we are joined today by two lovely ladies whose work and practice in this area I truly appreciate. So I've heard Elena and Rita talking about these topics numerous times in some conferences and they can really translate the science into practice in a really smart way. And in such a comprehensive way that I think this is going to be a tremendous addition to the already existing lineup of guests. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with this term, Red S is the broader, more comprehensive name for what was formerly known as the Female Athlete Triad, or simply the Triad, which was a condition seen in females participating in sports that emphasized leanness or low body weight. As it was also seen in males, the name was changed to the comprehensive term Red S, which may be more frequent than we think and that can have serious consequences not only for exercise performance of athletes, but for their long-term health as well. This may be connected or somehow aggravated by some pre-existing eating disorders, which we will be focusing our attention in order to try and provide you with tools to better identify and raise awareness for this problem. So let us not waste any more time and move on to today's episode 27, Red S and Disordered Eating in Endurance Athletes, a nutritionist perspective with Elena Trigueiro and Rita Giro, up next on Fuel the Pedal Podcast. And here we are, an episode exclusively with Portuguese guests, in this case, three Portuguese nutritionists. With me today, I have Helena Trigueiro. Bom dia, Helena. Welcome to Feel the Pedal. Hi, Gabriel. Thank you for the invitation. And Rita Giro. Olá, Rita. How are you doing? Hi, Gabriel. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation also. I'm fine. Thanks so much. And uh, as I've told you before, it's a great pleasure for me to be a guest on your podcast since I've been a follower from day one. So let's do this. <laughs> yeah, I know you are. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. We could name this episode uh, Three Portuguese Walk Into a Bar. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Positive. <laughs> Yeah, so ladies, again, this is an absolute pleasure uh, to be chatting with you today in English, not our usual language of communication, but we will do our best. And notice how I've pronounced their names. I know these are names that can be used in English as well, but here I'll be pronouncing their names in the Portuguese way. So I'm not going to say Rita or Elena, but rather Rita and Elena, is this okay, ladies, or do you prefer the English version of your names? Uh, no. Is it okay by me. <laughs> yes, let's go with the Portuguese version. <laughs> okay, Portuguese the version it is. <laughs> Terrific. So now that we got that clear, Rita, could you present yourself to the listeners? Of course. Um, so my name is Rita Giro. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist in Portugal, following my bachelor degree from the University of Porto, the equivalent to dietetics in the UK. And I'm also a um, sport and exercise nutrition registered practitioner in the UK, as I've uh, lived in the UK last year in Liverpool and graduated from uh, Liverpool John Moore's Master's in Sport Nutrition. Um, basically, my interest and experience with RADS is actually a funny story because it goes way back. Um, and I started about four years ago during my bachelor's applied placement, where I was fortunate enough to conduct my own research um, and with the support of both the hospital and the renowned gymnastics club uh, where I was doing my applied placement at, it, at the time. This research was conducted both in female and male adolescent gymnasts, and actually the focus of the research was primarily on the iron status of these athletes, but we accidentally found very interesting results concerning the concept of REDS, 
or uh, RED-S, the Relative Energy Efficiency in Sport, which at the time had surfaced uh, really recently. So our study showed that approximately 70% of our sample of 22 athletes was in a state of low energy availability and that none of the athletes met the recommended energy index for their age. So that obviously got me really intrigued on the subject, um, both because of the novelty of it, but also especially because I found significant prevalences of this low energy availability even in male gymnasts. And this uh, is probably the only topic in sports nutrition where we lack more research on males than females. So um, many questions remained and still remain, uh, which uh, uh, made me really interested on this topic. Um, and adding up to my first research project, I've also developed um, f further interest in this uh, area this past year, working with female athletes at the Liverpool FC Women's Club, as well as currently in my clinical and performance-oriented practice. Fantastic background, Rita, already bringing up some of the issues that we're going to be talking about today. Your turn, Elena. What can you tell us about you? So my, my path started in the University of Porto, where I did a bachelor's degree in nutritional science. And it was clear during my, my bachelor that my main interests were sport nutrition and public health. I started working as a trainee with kayak and canoeing athletes, and I became a registered dietitian and finished my master's degree in consumption sciences and nutrition. So this was my attempt to combine public health and sports nutrition and try to fight the pressure to specialize uh, in this. I, I studied nutrition and all supplement use in CrossFit athletes, and my professional practice in Portugal has been mainly sports nutrition, but also clinical nutrition, with a special focus, of course, also on science communication. In the UK, uh, I've been collaborating with NetPro Global Center for Nutrition and Health in Cambridge and around public health and uh, the development of some academic studies. That's it. Fantastic. So with both your excellent backgrounds in this area, I believe we have all the ingredients we need to tackle this topic and give a pure dietitian slash nutritionist view on this matter. So gone are the days when eating disorders were only a thing of female athletes. I believe it's unquestionable that some young girls and women who play sports or exercise intensely are at risk for a problem called the female athlete triad, which is a combination of low energy availability, menstrual disturbances and and low bone mineral density. But in recent years, it has become clear that this is a problem of both genders and based on the evidence, a broader term which includes what has been so far called uh, the female athlete triad is introduced, the relative energy deficiency in sport or red S as a consequence of low energy availability in athletes. So Rita and Elena will surely clarify us uh, on their meaning and how it applies to athletes of different endurance sport modalities including cycling, uh, the consequences they may present for such athletes and some preventive strategies or uh, red flags, if you will, to look out for. Personally, as a nutritionist, I think uh, that uh, this is an aggravated problem since athletes are usually very tough people, not only physically, uh, but also mentally uh, and can easily force themselves uh, to keep up with training and food restrictions for a long period of time, regardless of the situation or assuming that this is normal. But there may be other considerations such as uh, total time spent under that uh, chronic uh, low energy availability, uh, differences in gender and even in different uh, sports uh, we have to consider. So this is not a novel topic here on Fuel the Pedal. Back on episode 5 we had Dr. Nikki Key talking about bare bones in cyclists and how a low energy availability may compromise a bone health and performance. And on episode 16 we had Dr. Melinda Monora talking more specifically about the female athlete triad. So my idea with this episode is to provide a pure nutritionist view on this subject since uh, both both uh, Elena and Rita are pretty much into this subject and I've heard them talk about uh, these topics in congresses and conferences and I absolutely love their interventions. These girls are a, a true force to be reckoned with and since we're going to be three nutritionists with a very different backgrounds and practice, we might be able to provide a wider approach uh, to this subject that will hopefully enrich uh, today's talk. 
So today we will go through the latest evidence on Red S and give a particular focus on uh, male athletes. And then we're going to talk about uh, eating disorders that may be uh, frequent among uh, athletes. Uh, and we'll also uh, touch upon uh, Mary Kane's uh, case that I'm sure uh, most of you uh, may have heard about. And uh, we will try to raise awareness to this problem. So if you're a coach or an athlete who feels particularly identified with uh, some of the things that we mentioned here today, it might be a good idea to seek help help with a sports nutritionist or a dietitian in order to prevent or fix an already existing issue that may compromise uh, not only your sports performance, but your long-term health as well. So let's start this uh, round table with three Portuguese nutritionists speaking in English. And I would start with you, Elena. And before asking you the obvious definitions of uh, red S and low energy availability and how to diagnose them, I would really like to obtain your feedback feedback as a nutritionist who has been having uh, close contact with athletes uh, about the eating disorders and uh, the main reasons for athletes in general to engage into such practices so that listeners can understand uh, the main reasons for athletes to do this. So what eating disorders are more prevalent in athletes and uh, perhaps a more contemporary vision asking you as well uh, if you believe that athletes nowadays are faced with additional pressure from sponsoring for example and social media as well well regarding the prevalence i think um, to frame your question uh, when we zoom out so if you see the prevalence in the general population so according to the who there are 70 million people who are dealing and struggling with eating disorders. And from these 70 million, 20%, only 20%, uh, try to uh, seek treatment for, for this condition. And I believe that, you know, maybe in athletes, um, given their usual uh, resilience, their bigger ex and acceptance of negative circumstances, I think this percentage can be even lower. So my main concern is that in athletes, the, the prevalence is highly variable. So in aesthetic sports, it's estimated to be 42%. Uh, in endurance sports, around 24%. Uh, in team sports, which are usually not uh, associated with eating disorders, uh, it's also uh, not to be dismissed with uh, 16%. So when you look at this, this landscape, I think that the, the main concern should be to definitely diagnose correctly these eating disorders in, in athletes and really to develop more uh, literature around this topic. Uh, regarding the eating disorders uh, that are more prevalent, uh, well, according to, to literature, it has been said and studied that usually uh, the main focus and the main findings are around anorexia and bulimia. But also, I should say that these two eating disorders have been the ones with more focus around the DSM-5. And still, there are some eating disorders, such as orthorexia, which are not considered in the DSM-5. So when you're going to do research around these eating disorders and, and you want to develop and design a clinical protocol around the clinical gold standard that is DSM-5, it is normal that some of these uh, eating disorders won't be included. So yes, the, the main and the more prevalent are anorexia and bulimia, I don't think we should discard the others. And when we think about the pressure that you mentioned, I think there's certainly more pressure now from social media, obviously. has its pros, for sure, especially for these athletes to gain sponsorships. But uh, on the other hand, if you, if you think about the, this constant feeling of uh, living in in Big Brother almost, and worrying about weight since childhood, some pressure that can exist uh, from their team, from their coaches, and the general stigma around these eating disorders. These eating disorders have a stigma that is almost like a mist around them. And if that is hard for uh, the general population, when you think about a population such as athletes who are used to be resilient, to have to deal with pain, to have to deal with effort in sometimes extreme terms, it's easy to understand that these impacts and this social background really will have and take its toll on this athlete's mental health and eventually eating disorders because we can't forget that, of course, eating disorders, their effects, uh, their symptoms are around food, but there are 
psychiatric conditions, psychiatric diseases. And just to to give a little bit of context also about the prevalence, uh, regarding athletes in general, we have a general prevalence of around 20% in female athletes and around 9% in male athletes. So it's definitely something that could and should also be taken in consideration when approaching the male athlete as well. Great way of starting this. I would say that from my perspective, athletes do have an increased pressure from all sides, but especially to look a certain way. Some of them are sponsored by supplement brands that also put pressure on them. But I would risk in saying that athletes nowadays train much harder, much longer, much earlier, and perhaps with more urge to somewhat show their bodies on social media, which subsequently influences other people and sets standards of beauty. Would you agree, Rita? Yeah, so of course I agree with you. Um, we see that uh, looking at soccer, for example, and the show that soccer provides also, it must put a lot of pressure on the players. Um, and uh, I, I would like to maybe, because obviously the the game and the sport and many sports in general have, as you said, over the years, increased their intensity. So uh, obviously that puts a lot of pressure on the athletes and also maybe just con- uh, complimenting a bit what Elena said and regarding the um, the reasons why athletes engage into such practices I think here comes the role of the coaches and the importance of them being aware of eating disorders and of uh, you know very severe energy restrictions because it must be really this idea of reaching the top must be really attractive to the athletes obviously and if they can do it through practices that are not prohibited like doping um, and looking at these coaches who many times uh, have themselves reached the top in and had great achievements in the past, uh, I'm sure that these athletes will follow the indications and the recommendations of the coaches. So if they are told that, you know, losing a lot of weight and uh, putting into practice uh, certain nutritional strategies will be good for them, they will ultimately do it, even if they question it at first, or many athletes will. So obviously this uh, um, importance of, obviously social media puts out a lot of information, but of actually having education coming from professional nutritional practitioners is um, essential in my opinion. No doubt, I agree completely, and I I think that's exactly where we dietitians and nutritionists come in to balance out things for athletes, not to get into that dark deep hole of uh, eating disorders. And yes, I would include orthorexia as well, that obsession with healthy eating, uh, so typical in times like these. And this leads uh, right into all the uh, red ass problematic and the the low energy availability issue. So uh, Rita, could you enlighten us and explain what exactly is this low energy availability we've been talking? talking about and how can we calculate it and how can it lead to to red s in particular in endurance athletes such as runners cyclists and triathletes and what consequences are to be expected in terms of health and exercise performance in both female and male athlete um so this whole concept of energy availability is nothing more than the amount of energy out of how much the athlete ingests that is left for the body to function with once uh, we take out how much is spent in planned exercise activity, so in training and um, exercise and in sport. And that's why it's expressed as kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass, uh, basically to correct for the individual weight of each person's most metabolically active tissues, which are the ones that spend more energy. And considering that we spend energy to ensure that our most basic uh, physiological functions are maintained, like, for example, thermoregulation, uh, cellular maintenance, uh, locomotion, reproduction, and obviously growth and development during childhood and adolescence, it's only logical that when there's a severe restriction of energy, of calories, then we have a development of a, a low energy availability state, which basically seems to correspond to, um, uh, so th- we have this classic threshold of uh, 30 kilocalories per kilogram of fat free mass per day, which seems to correspond more or less to the average RMR. So if we go below that, we start to see consequences to health and to performance. Um, and it's only logical because because if the body is not able to optimally fuel all of these functions, then it will start attenuating some of the less essential ones for survival. 
And uh, as you said, um, in women, this condition is relatively easier to spot because they have a period. Uh, and one of the first systems to get compromised is the, the reproductive one. So um, as you've uh, in introduced our conversation, uh, talking about the female athlete triad, um, it is for sure something to consider uh, because when we're talking about female athletes, if they are lightweight, if they're very lean, um, and if at age 15 they report that they have not yet had their first period, then we can suspect that primary amenorrhea is present. If she has had her monarch but has not menstruated for over three consecutive months, then we might be facing secondary amenorrhea. And both of these states are a reason for concern um, over their energy availability because it, these uh, menstrual disturbances can appear about only a month of being in this uh, low energy availability state. And whether this low energy availability is intentional or not, it seems to be at the heart of many other problems as well. Um, and more serious health outcomes such as low bone mineral density and then ultimately stress fractures or osteoporosis end up many times being what, uh, which, which leads the athletes to actually get diagnosed with the so-called female athlete triad and realize that they have a problem at hands and that they need to change certain practices. So basically this concept of uh, re the relative energy deficiency in sport or reds has then emerged as an extension of the female athlete triad to consider uh, consequences uh, of this low energy availability also to other populations, not just female athletes, but for example, also male athletes athletes and to propose other consequences to health such as of endocrine, metabolic, psychological nature, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, hematological, immunological, which at this time with the coronavirus is so important. If we don't have enough energy, that will also suffer. And then ultimately to performance, although um, the performance impairments are less well established, are more theoretically proposed, so we need more research uh, in this area. Uh, still, it's only logical that if the athletes are under restrained eating practices that will interfere with meeting the targets for energy, for carbohydrates, for uh, the nutrients that they need for performance, and, that, and therefore there will be performance um, impairments as well. Um, and uh, this concept, as I was saying initially, also recognizes that male athletes can suffer from low energy availability and it considers that they can reflect some of these uh, very same consequences, but it seems to be much harder to detect them in male athletes due to the lower cost of reproduction that they have and also the higher absolute amount of uh, bone mass and fat, you know, and muscle mass, so fat fat mass. Um, and uh, talking about endurance athletes specifically, it seems like they are particularly at risk because on the one hand, their exercise energy expenditure is really high due to the long duration of this type of exercise. Um, they have high training loads. And so their requirements, considering energy intake, are higher as well for carbohydrates, for overall energy. But many times, even unintentionally, they are not met. And so that's where the problems start. Then also we have to consider the fact that uh, uh, this uh, condition, the low energy availability and, and its consequences seem to be more common in sports like athletics, cycling and even dancing, um, where being light and lean or maximizing the power to mass ratio uh, could make a significant difference to performance. So in these cases, this has to be very well and acutely managed, not to hamper health, which should always be the, the priority. Rita, I will make an additional question that just popped into my mind and that has to do with a video I shared with both of you a few days before on Twitter by Dr. Cal Lagan Evans, uh, your former colleague from Liverpool John Morris University, making some really interesting points. First, uh, we seem to assume that low energy availability is an acute state and that we may need to think about the time spent under that low energy availability state. Uh, also, the fact that this threshold uh, should be different for males and female athletes as you said, uh, the energy cost of reproductive function is much higher in women. And three, in some sports such as cycling or even combat sports, there are specific periods of cutting uh, where you inevitably enter in this low energy availability state, but not for enough time for us to see any consequences. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, of course. Um, as I was saying, uh, it seems like 
in at least in research coming from female athletes, approximately 45 kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass seems to correspond to being in energy balance. Uh, if we go below that, up to the 30 kilocalories, it seems like we're in a negative energy balance that is not yet uh, significant in most cases to uh, induce you know, at least severe impairments. But this also seems to be very uh, individual. And that's that's important that we uh, that we recognize because more and more, I, I know there, there's research um, being conducted in, on this theme uh, to actually develop a scale of probability of developing the menstrual disturbances because um, we're not, we can't say that everybody below 30 kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass will have problems. Some people will uh, maybe have them above this threshold and others below. Um, and as I was saying, with male athletes, because the reproductive cost of, uh, is, is lower and because they have more bone mass and more muscle mass, uh, it seems like they are more protected from injury. They are also more protected from um, the other consequences of red. So it ends up being uh, harder to detect. And probably uh, there are some studies that have been conducted only up to four to six months looking at uh, these adverse effects. And some uh, have detected that at thresholds as low as 15 kilocalories per kilogram fat-free mass or even five have shown only you know, uh, uh, lower levels of testosterone, lower levels of other anabolic hormones and higher levels of the catabolic, obviously, because they're in energy restriction. And maybe some uh, mood swings, maybe some, um, you know, impairments to protein synthesis, but many times they're not as translated as they are in, in females, because obviously the first thing we see in females is uh, disturbances in, in their menstrual cycle in the absence or irregular cycles. And in males, we can see this. So we actually have to go and test them, their blood levels, examine them to see if uh, they're already being uh, hampered by this condition. Um, or not, but it's probably a, a much lower threshold that these impairments will start to be uh, detectable and then visible. Brilliant explanation, Rita. I think you made this quite clear for the listeners to better understand the diagnosis and the, the consequences that red eyes may have for athletes of both genders. And now I believe Elena has something to say. Yes, uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes I struggle with um, the usual habit of uh, joining reds and eating disorders in the same bowl. And I think that's definitely something that has to be explored and explained. Uh, and I think that's what we are doing here today as well. So in terms of uh, reds and low energy availability, there's definitely some conditions that Rita described. Rita, sorry, let's go with the Portuguese <laughs> version. <laughs> so that Rita described that um, can definitely be found in athletes with eating disorders. But having REDS doesn't mean the athlete has an eating disorder. And I think that's something we should focus and we should communicate very clearly, especially when we go through more ancient literature, <laughs> which is like 10 years ago. Uh, <laughs> but when we go through that literature, sometimes we find that the limit and the barrier between REDS and eating disorders, it's not very explained and I think that if we have this opportunity to say that okay sometimes they can coexist and sometimes some athletes with eating disorders may have reds so okay that's a cohabiting issue but uh, there are many many athletes with reds that don't have eating disorders and since they don't have eating disorders and sometimes they don't have the typical ED body that coaches associate with anorexia, which is the main eating disorder they think, they don't take these symptoms seriously. So sometimes the athlete uh, may not have been having her period for long, but she is performing well. She doesn't look too sick, which is an expression I've heard from coaches. She doesn't look too sick. So they don't take this into consideration. And I think that uh, regarding all what Rita said, there's uh, this focus on communication has to be really done by us. Most of the coaches don't read papers. That's uh, at least in Portugal, that's the reality. Most of, most of the coaches I've dealt with, they don't know what's, what's an abstract. That's just the way it is. And if we don't do the work of 
communicating this and making the information go from paper to practice to coaches, we will never achieve what we want, which is evidence-based practice around sports and to break sometimes the barriers and the glass ceilings of the system in which some athletes are raised because they start as children. We must be more efficient in, in communicating science. And I think some, that's something, obviously, Gabriel is doing in an amazing way. And I hope uh, a lot of coaches hear this podcast and all of your podcasts, because it's an opportunity to listen to science in a comprehensible way and in an easy and practical way. So, yes, that paper-to-practice approach, it's really something I think should be uh, developed and cherished. Helena, just so much to take from your answer. First, that REDS is not necessarily associated with an eating disorder, which is a very important point because in cycling, and I believe cycling may provide a better example here, with the high demands of training and competition alone, you may easily get into that state of low energy availability without intentionally uh, restricting food intake. And then this translation of science into practice that I believe we are gradually improving, whether it is using infographics, podcasts, live Live webinars and other platforms but yeah i would agree that there is still a lot of work to be done in this area and elena since we are going through very particular times i wonder what your opinion is regarding the current coronavirus quarantine isolation and how might have contributed to worsening some of the pre-existing eating disorders in athletes so in your opinion do you believe that uh, athletes or people in general with eating disorders uh, might have particularly struggled during this times in isolation I think definitely quarantine was was worse for um, athletes with previous predisposition to develop eating disorders or athletes who are currently struggling with eating disorders and um, managing the disease between uh, very narrow walls. So, you know, when we think about eating disorders, despite uh, the prevalence, which I've mentioned is high and higher than most people think, um, and the toll that eating disorders have on society, because if you talk to psychiatrists, if you if you talk to patients with eating disorders, you can see that the impact of their disease in the family, in their social circle, in their teams is immense. But despite all of this, we lack some comprehensive understanding of the etiology of eating disorders. So that means we, we have significant limitations uh, in order to prevent, to detect, to treat this class of disorders. Uh, and when we don't understand exactly the etiology and when there's not a common understanding of why these people are developing the disease, what does the disease mean in terms of psychiatric mental connections, in terms of uh, behavior? It's harder to identify conditions and environments that worsen worse this condition. So I would say that definitely quarantine was, was worse for eating disorders in athletes. And even um, the Olympian, Rachel Fatt is an athlete, Olympian, and she wrote a master's dissertation on eating disorders, which I invite you all to read. And she she was very clear to the, to an interesting, very interesting piece in the New York Times about this. And so was Madison Keys, tennis player. She has been extremely outspoken about the impact that um, isolation, quarantine has had on their on athletes prone to develop uh, eating disorders who are recovering it, from eating disorders. And I think we own for sure a lot of research that has been done now today. A lot of the need from scientists, for people like us, for nutritionists, to talk more about this problem. I think we owe that to athletes that have been outspoken and brave, uh, despite all the stigma surrounding this disease. Um, that has uh, overshadowed the field for decades and for sure has perpetuated misconceptions about the causes. I think we owe that a lot to, to them. And this time is dangerous for athletes that have a very inflexible and healthy relationship with food. And as an athlete, you have to have things under control. You can just let faith or circumstances rule the game for you. Otherwise, you lose and you're not the athlete you are working every day to be. So in this pandemic, control is not something we have. <laughs> we don't have control. <laughs> and this added anxiety uh, certainly doesn't help at all managing uh the disease doesn't help managing also the unhealthy thoughts around food that can come back for people that already suffer from eating disorders and that are constantly struggling if the the treatment was not done correctly uh, if there was some loose ends in the treatment 
uh, these circumstances can really uh, make it worse. Um, I wrote about this regarding the general population, but maybe when I think about it, maybe I should have mentioned this regarding also athletes, uh, because the impact on most of their uh, most of the aspects of their of their lives are conditioned, the, especially the lack of routine. If you are living your life in a totally different way, if your practice and training routine uh, is affected, if your uh, sleeping habits are affected, if you don't try to maintain your um, your meal plan, your meal routines, your meal uh, time, and be be very precise about the need to eat at a certain time and place, um, that's definitely going to affect uh, most of the aspects of these athletes' uh, life sphere. So I think that today, and especially since there's this new need to live in a different way and to be aware of the need to socially isolate, I think that athletes who are prone to develop eating disorders, who, who are currently uh, dealing with them, should really focus on keeping their routines as much as they can, their food habits, and also keep their contacts with their mental and health professionals, with their nutritionists, and with their teams, and be very clear to their coaches and their family members, uh, their partners, their friends, about the things they are going through and the things they need at the moment. So, yes, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. No doubt that athletes who are brave enough to come out to the public and tell their story are unfortunately necessary to raise awareness on this. And Mary Kane is a perfect example of that. We'll get into Mary Kane's case right after the next question, which is regarding the signs or the most obvious red flags, if you will, that we should look out for um, to identify or that can tell the coach or the athletes that um, he or she may be at risk uh, and action needs to be taken. And also, Rita, for you, uh, what tools and questionnaires do we have to identify low energy availability and red ass in both males and female athletes? Okay, so um, okay, so unfortunately, there's not as of yet any validated tools that allow us to diagnose the condition or detect low energy availability. Only a few questionnaires that help us identify or screen those athletes who are at risk for the female athlete triad, like uh, the LIFQ. Uh, that that has been developed especially for female athletes, but I know there's a, a male version under development. Or we can use the tool that the group of scientists that uh, published the concept and proposed the concept of REDS have also proposed, which uh, allows us to conduct a risk assessment and a readiness to return to play uh, assessment through a clinical interview. That's called the REDS CAT. But unfortunately, for example, the LEAF-Q has only been validated in endurance female athletes of over 16 years of age. And all of these tools have plenty of limitations because, as we know, there's no standardized way of assessing energy intake or energy expenditure. Or um, And when we assess energy availability, it only gives us a valid assessment at that time. But we don't know temporary-wise how long that has been and the rep. So right now, in my opinion, the best way to spot these issues and what I do in my clinical practice is uh, creating rapport with the athletes, talking to them, um, conducting a clinical interview and understanding their food habits, like if they are dieting, if they're restricting their food throughout the day. Uh, if they show prolonged fatigue or mood swings, because uh, even though the, there's not a validated tool and uh, even in, in regards to the threshold, we, do, we know there's not a, um, a certain answer, we can still use it, this, this current threshold, as a criteria to sort of at least spot a potential low energy availability state. And then, of course, through anthropometric assessments, if they're conducted by an accredited professional and if the athlete doesn't seem to present disordered eating behaviors or eating disorders this is really important because if they do present them we might make it uh, worse but for example in you know child and adult, children and adolescents if we suspect of the condition like i said previously if we can see that uh, there's probably primary or secondary amenorrhea or repeated stress stress fractures on those athletes we should refer them to a doctor to do some blood hormone tests to assess assess bone mineral density, uh, obviously look at their nutrition, look out for those athletes just like cyclists of sports that from the get-go may be particularly at risk. And then in children and adolescents, as I was going to say, not only look for uh, primary amino 
primary and potentially secondary, but it's also uh, useful to monitor their weight, their height and their growth charts. Because if we see that there has been recent drastic change in their percentile, for example, then we can be more uh, attentive to these to these questions, because in this particular population uh, during growth and development, if uh, low energy availability is, is present, it may actually result in more severe to even irrever irreversible negative consequences uh, like short stature, pubertal delay, um, poor bone health other than the disruption or cessation of the menstruation. Um, and even premature osteoporosis. So we need to be really attentive to these questions, also because they will ultimately have implications in sport performance, negative ones. So, um, you know, even in a recently published commentary or update from the, the very same authors that proposed the REDS concept together with Mary Kane, um, they actually discourage the body composition assessments uh, in this stage of development and encourage more the discussions to be held with in one-to-one and from a health but not a performance perspective. So that's basically what I try to prioritize in, in my clinical practice, for sure. Mm -hmm. I really like this last part you said about using more one-on-one -on -one discussions rather than using body composition assessments at a young age or in athletes who are still physically developing, if you will, in a much more health and not performance-based approach. Something to consider. So uh, since we've been talking so much about Mary Kane, uh, she was an example uh, of the consequences that low energy availability and the pressure to be thin uh, can have in a young, talented athlete athlete. And according Mary, uh, she said in an interview, uh, I got caught in a system designed by and for men, which destroys the bodies of young girls, said Mary Kane as she described her toxic relationship with her coach Alberto Salazar and exposed his unhealthy coaching and nutrition practices. So first of all, I would really like to hear what was your immediate reaction to this case when you first heard of it. And this is also something that troubles me, which is um, some coaches I talk to, particularly particularly the, the most old-fashioned ones, but still in the game, uh, they still assume that it's normal for a female athlete to lose your menses if you're an athlete. And I get this from some female athletes here in Spain as well. So, Elena, do you agree that there are a lot more silenced Mary Canes in sport or that they are simply unaware that they have a problem? My uh, honest immediate reaction was I called Rita and I asked if she would write about this with me. <laughs> and then I tried to find um, a media editor that would publish our article. And luckily someone did. And I think that was really important because I think Mary Kane didn't understand the real impact of her bravery. I have so many more Mary Kanes, which is understandable considering the way these athletes learn to live to perform um the way these athletes are taught that you are supposed to be in pain um, and it's very hard for us sometimes when we are we are dealing with toxic coaches which some sometimes happens and when we are dealing with toxic thoughts from these athletes which happens many many times it's hard for us to set the boundaries between health and performance but in the end of the day If you're not healthy in some months, you won't be able to perform the way you want. There are, okay, there are many athletes who seem slimmer than them, but there are so many more cases of people who struggle with eating disorders. Uh, we can talk about Katie Rigby, who battled anorexia and bulimia 12 years. Uh, she went into cardiac arrest twice. We can talk about Christy Enrich, who died of an anorexia in 94, and she was only 22. And she was the world championship gymnast. We can talk about Ban Rab, who suffered, for, suffered from anorexia and died with pneumonia and extreme malnutrition. We can talk about Christian Moser, who battled with anorexia, Grassy Gold. I think we have a lot of examples in elite athletes that tell us that unhealthy paths are not the way to go. And once we get to explain that to athletes, we win the, the argument and we win that negotiation. Of course, there has to be some uh, compromise from both parts. And sometimes these consultations with these athletes look like uh, lawyer appointments or some kind of trial because we are, uh, both of us are negotiating future behaviors and future thoughts that are allowed. And in regards to Mary Kane, I think 
the impact she had on coaches that would read the piece from the New York Times and read other pieces like from all over the world, like me and Rita did. I think the main communication uh, to get coaches to understand would be the need to de-emphasize weight all the time and be aware of how you are communicating about weight and performance. Try to not correlate those two all the time, to focus on ways for athletes to enhance their performance rather than just fat shaming them and keep telling them that losing weight is always the way to performance. It's not always the way to get performance. Uh, try to keep an open dialogue with athletes about the importance of nutrition, of optimal athletic performance, and recognize that this is, I think, it's one of the main uh, points. Body composition training that are required for optimal performance are not identical for all athletes, are not identical for all sports, are not identical sometimes for the same sport for athletes in different positions or with different parts to play. So I think once we get this message across um, coaches and athletes and families and partners and friends and all the social sphere around athletes, we are many steps closer to helping these athletes in an integrated, holistic way. Yeah, a really nice message to get across, Elena. And it's true. I mean, there is still a, this dark shadow of doing things the same way that have been consistently done in the past. And cyclists may, well, in particular, female cycling, uh, which is rising now more and more and becoming more competitive each year, may be at risk of uh, existing there some uh, more Americans. And you, Rita, what was your reaction to this American case? It was uh, pretty much the same as uh, Elena just said. And uh, once we collaborated, we really tried to pass this message that um, in a way, even though this is a very sad situation, it was really, really great that Mary came out and uh, told her story because this is going to raise awareness to the problem. This is that gave a lot of attention to the, the red syndrome. And uh, because obviously this emphasizes the need to have Uh, in clubs and in uh, teams, uh, support from a nutritional professional, for sure. And in line just with what uh, Elena said, uh, I would just like to add that in a recently published case by Arete Al from LJMU, which followed um, an amenorrheic female cyclist, so just to shift the focus again to cycling, um, she was returning to training and competition and eventually resumpted her menses uh, while increasing and then maintaining her training loads. But when coupled with high energy availability and with some increasing body mass, she she was actually able to resump her menses about five to six months after this weight gain episode. But still her performance remained high and uh, was achieved despite this increase in body mass. So this is all to say that the composition the body composition targets and the weight management aims are not a one for all type of thing so the targets are only numbers and each case and nutritional strategy should be tailored to the individual as some might even perform better with higher percentages of body fat or slightly more weight than what would be advisable or desirable uh, if they are in fact healthy feeling strong and with enough energy to exercise because that's the main the most important thing and what will ultimately determine performance Yeah, sure. Rita, thank you for bringing up that great case study by Jose Areta with an amenorrheic female cyclist showing that the resumption of menses in female athletes and despite increasing body weight, uh, performance can perfectly be maintained while uh, maintaining high training loads. And since we are shifting towards cycling, cycling is a sport where weight is a fundamental part of performance, as most of the listeners are aware, particularly considering the, the basic power to weight ratio of performance particular importance in uh, climbers. Uh, there is some previous work performed by Dr. Nikki Key, who has been here on the podcast, showing an alarming 44% low bone mineral density in a sample of 50 male competitive road cyclists, ranging from 18 to 71 years of age. And from this 50, 14 riders, around 28% were identified as having low energy availability. Now, I know you've already uh, mentioned the consequences of low energy availability, Rita, for athletes athletes in general, but I'd really like your opinion specifically in cycling considering how physically demanding is. Uh, what consequences do you possibly see here in terms of uh, cyclist health and performance? 
Okay, so um, again, in this work you just cited, it's also interesting to see that the percentage body fat of the athletes who were um, investigated was actually not significantly linked to cycling performance. Um, and this was a, a considerable sample, so 55 male uh, cyclists. But obviously, weight and power to ratio is something to consider performance-wise. There's no question um, about that around the time of competition. Um, so... This is when acute strategies to induce a negative energy balance and potentially even a slightly low energy availability state can be employed. But it, it always has to be accompanied by a professional because if we keep this for a short period of time, this will probably not translate into significant impairments to health. But uh, if this uh, low energy availability state becomes chronic, then in uh, male athletes and specifically in uh, cyclists, uh, there have been reports on, uh, obviously, one of the, the first things to see is a, a decrease in the levels of testosterone, uh, some endocrine disruption, so lower uh, glucose availability, lower anabolic like insulin, leptin, cortisol also, uh, hormones and higher catabolic hormone expression. Then there's also uh, observations on lower bone turnover markers that start to be absorbed when um, we're talking about these longer duration studies of about four to six months. In cycling, um, this low energy availability and the disordered eating behaviors or eating disorders may also contribute to impairments of mood, uh, in performance, in protein synthesis, and consequently in recovery. So that's, again, another thing to consider as to why energy is so important here. Uh, and then obviously, because as we've talked about before, it is a, an endurance sport where the energy expenditure in exercise is, is uh, really high. And so they have to meet the requirements. And many times they don't just unintentionally. It's not even a, um, a connected to the, the eating disorders. Still, these lower uh, bone and mass density values um, seem to be more linked to the fact that um, the, the sport lacks weight-bearing exercise many times accompanying it. So resistance training and uh, to the unloading of the spide while riding, which provides a poor osteogenic stimulus, ultimately, then actually to low energy availability. So uh, they, they, they still have other uh, high prevalence of other um, injuries, but not so much as a consequence to Leah. So um, I think overall, these are the main, the main things to look out for in cycling. But obviously, there's yet a lot to uh, research on. And uh, this is why this area of the male athlete is uh, so interesting uh, uh, as of right now and to me personally. Rita, you just made my job easier since you already talked about the risk of injury, which would be uh, one of my following questions. So uh, moving on, we've been talking about not going too low on energy, but there are moments in cycling and other sports as well in which we need to periodize both energy and carbohydrate intake according to the exercise session performed. So these are situations in which we can intentionally include in our food plan some restrictions in carbohydrate and energy to enhance training adaptations in endurance cyclists for example so my question would be uh, do athletes who are at risk of low energy availability or that have a pre-existing eating disorder may not be the best candidates for engaging into such protocol and also Elena a bonus question regarding the fact that uh, low energy availability is expressed in fat-free mass and unless we have a, a DEXA available which is uh, not the case in most of the times a nutritionist or another professional accredited in uh, thrombometry uh, to measure skin fold thickness is necessary for this job. So what changes need to occur to include more anthropometry accredited professionals to help monitor and prevent this condition? Well, regarding this, the signs, we should be trying to look for. Um, as you mentioned, um, and as you, we know, there are a lot of nutritional strategies that involve uh, carbohydrate restriction. So some of these nutritional um, strategies can be in incompatible with the profile of the athlete, and especially if it's an athlete prone to develop an eating disorder. I think what we should be looking for is some abnormal preoccupation and thoughts about food and eating. If we see there's a discomfort talking about the, the weight, or on the other hand, an extreme need to talk always about the weight. If we can see that there is irritability, 
uh, mood changes that can easily be reported by uh, their family, their colleagues, if it's a team sport. If there's sleep disturbance, especially regarding social withdrawal, we see that many social activities have a, a need to eat. So most of the friends' dinners, the family uh, reunions with food, it, the, the athletes won't be comfortable and will try to make excuses not to go. We should also look for gastrointestinal discomfort. If the coaches report unusual weakness during practice, unusual cold intolerance, if it's not that cold, but the athletes, it's extremely cold, uh, impaired concentration, apathy, and some perception of society that is way too high from what it's supposed. So the athlete didn't eat that much, but he also uh, already feels very full. So I think those are some of the, the signs we should be looking for. Regarding what you said about uh, the inclusion of nutritionist strain in anthropometry, I think and what I will say, it's maybe can be debatable. I think uh, nutritionists accredited in anthropometry is very important. I think nutritionists should know a lot about anthropometry. Okay. But I would rather have more nutritionists being accredited in psychology notions, in people dealing conditions and abilities, because it doesn't matter if I have a nutritionist in the team that knows uh, the difference between um, events, a skinfold equation uh, or a slaughter at all, uh, who knows a lot about um, types of skinfolds and how to measure them. I think that's extremely important, but I want a nutritionist that know, uh, know about people as well and knows the importance that food has on these athletes and about the need sometimes to involve also the psychologists that can help these um, these athletes with some cognitive behavioral therapy enhanced, with some other strategies that can really tackle the problem in all its glory, which is not glorious at all. I think that's this, and, and especially Elizabeth Joy wrote about this um, Regarding a review with a focus on the clinical assessment and the management, there's a graph that I really like that has the athlete in the center, and then you have the physician, you have the mental health professional, and you have the dietitian, and you have the coach. And I think you, there, it's impossible uh, to tackle eating disorders just with a dietitian or a nutritionist, just with a physician, just with a mental health professional, just with a coach, because we are not trained and we don't have to be trained uh, to do, deal with with all of the spheres of the problem. So I think a multidisciplinary team is really the key to to help these athletes. And of course, there, there's the need for nutritionists to be trained in anthropometry, but we, I think we should be better trained in people as well. The importance of including psychologists in sports teams as part of a multidisciplinary approach and for us to be closer to people, a fundamental skill that we often forget. Rita, would you add anything? Uh, yeah, in line with what uh, you just commented on about, uh, Gabriel, on the multidisciplinary need for, uh, you know, an integrative approach, I think that the sports nutritionist dietitian also has a really important part in educating these other professionals because they are the people who are many times most in contact with the athletes. So from the get-go, also educating other athletes, their colleagues, their people of the same age that are many times some of the most influential ones uh, on their friends uh, on, on these questions of energy availability, of uh, uh, what happens if you're uh, too low in in energy for your sport, that this is all a cycle. You are doing so much to potentiate your performance, but if you ultimately compromise your health uh, for it, you will also compromise your performance. Uh, and then also uh, educating their uh, families, their, their parents, uh, of course, their coaches, um, and always trying to do it with an openness and to discuss these questions without taboos. Um, like, for instance, I, I, I found it very funny when I, when I read uh, these insights from Dr. Stacy Sims on the education of male coaches, because they would always get a little bit embarrassed when she would talk about the, the periods and all those things. So this has to become a normal thing because they will be the ones who will then talk to the athletes, to the female athletes in this case, and they have 
have to be uh, confident in, enough in, in themselves and in the information they're putting out. Uh, so some of these stigmas have to be eliminated as well. And then obviously uh, putting less focus on the image of the athlete and more focus on health. Um, that seems to me like essential to then prevent some of these signs and some of these consequences. No doubt. That is so true. I mean, coaches really do need to start taking that topic in a more uh, natural way, because as you said, they're the ones in contact with the athletes. And since amenorrhea is one of the main consequences that we should look out for, the more reason to have a certain openness about it. So we're almost getting to the end of this episode. But before wrapping up, I'd like to have your opinion on social media. And what role do you believe social media plays in all this, not only as a culprit in putting pressure on the athletes, to look a certain way, but also as a possible vehicle of change and awareness raising tool to help fight this? Well, we know that among factors that contribute for the development of eating disorders and some of the behaviors that will also may also lead to, to REDS, we know that social environmental factors play a huge role. And regarding these factors, we, we can't ignore the influence of media and the time athletes spend in social media. Because obviously social media um, has its pros, as I said, and allows you to engage with your fans and allows you to seek support, especially when days are harder and your practice is not doing so well, it's not being so easy. So I think social media can have a positive impact, but especially around weight questions, it's very, very toxic in general. So I think some measures like trying to reduce and manage the time you spend uh, on social media, trying to reduce the time you spend actually also on TV or on your cell phone and trying to improve your self-esteem and self-confidence because there's this tendency to um, trying to look for validation everywhere and sports uh, in social media and sports athletes. Uh, it's so I think uh, athletes should not look for validation just in social media and in social media in general and should be aware of the dangers uh, that it might play in their mental health. There's a huge pressure on athletes uh, to be fit, to be the role model of body composition. And as we mentioned, sometimes the the idea that the general population has of an athlete's body, it's not what the athlete needs. So I think education solves the problem. We should educate the public and we should educate uh, the athlete as well to deal with this immense pressure. Rita, what can you say? I would just add, um, I think uh, Elena explained it very well, but I would just add that considering social media can have some positive effects as well if we manage it um, uh, as best as we can. And I think that a, a, a great way to, in terms of sports nutrition, get information that is valid and that is, um, you know, it, it ends up, these uh, social media networks end up being also a great way to get good information if we follow the right people. So obviously, if you have the opportunity to consult with, um, well, this talking to athletes directly, if you have the opportunity to consult with a club's nutritionist, uh, with your own team's nutritionist, then great, do it. Uh, but perhaps start um, starting to manage the people that you follow are those, uh, you know, celebrities, influencers, uh, Facebook recipe sharing groups, or are those actually sports nutritionists in the field? Are those, you know, uh, people who uh, work in, in the academia in research? This at times it's is is hard for athletes to be able to tell so the the differences and what is actually useful and what isn't but you can get help from your um, athlete support personnel at your club and your team um, and uh, gladly there's a lot of great information out there as well so if we follow the right people that might be ultimately helpful in my opinion and that's a growing issue, isn't it? The art of unfollowing. We could almost say that given the dimensions that this has gained, it wouldn't be a bad idea perhaps to include in our nutrition sessions tools to help our athletes choose who to follow and why and who to unfollow. Uh, you know, the basic signs to look out for, the credentials, uh, because it's so easy to follow a certain profile based on images, uh, recipes and physical attributes uh, that it becomes so difficult for them to filter what's good and and what's not. 
Anyway, uh, regardless of this, uh, what take-home messages would you leave our listeners with and what research uh, do you feel that is yet to be done? Elena? I would highlight that eating disorders are no choices. They are serious biologically influenced illnesses. Uh, anorexia is the most lethal psychiatric condition. Uh, the the percentage of uh, eating disorder patients that try to commit suicide is not to be uh, dismissed. And luckily, there have been some high profile cases of professionals. Athletes with eating disorders, uh, and that includes obviously, since this is a, a cycling focused podcast, uh, Yanni Brakovic, who have been so brave in sharing their, his, their stories and sharing their personal experiences, which I think, like Mary Kane, brings great awareness and motivates us, motivates uh, other professionals to be aware of this problem. Eating disorders, they, they carry a, a risk for obviously a lot of medical complications. There's a need for a multidisciplinary team, but full recovery is possible. And I think that's the message we should get across. Uh, those thoughts won't be around forever. So, yes, you can fight them with the help you need. And regarding studies that I would like to see and literature that I would see, I like to see develop, in general terms in sports nutrition, I would love to see more science being studied on samples of women because uh, usually it's always men. And my colleagues, they lecture me about the need to be men are easier to study because men don't take the birth control. Men don't do this and that. But I think science should follow reality. We, are, we shouldn't design studies for them to be clean and cut because life is not clean and cut. Athletes are not samples. We, we should base and look for samples that represent the average athlete of that type. And that includes women. Uh, I think it's time for, for scientists to step down of their pedestals and be more 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 aware of the need to include sample of women and also more research about eating disorders in athletes that actually gets published in good papers because usually uh, and sometimes <laughs> uh, we see this uh, regarding eating disorders um, not that much with reds uh, but with eating disorders it's very frequent to see these studies just being published in eating disorder type of journals. And this is not good. I think these studies should be spread across and should be accepted in other journals. And yes, that would be my main takeaways for the, from this amazing conversation. How about you, Rita? Um, well, on the one hand, I completely agree with Elena, also as a female and as a, you know, a female sports nutritionist, but uh, a little bit more in relation to my area, which is um, the low energy availability and REDS. And although I'm in no way an expert in these areas, but I'm an enthusiast who has been reading more and more on the subject over time, I'm sure the boom on Red's research on interest and the translation to applied practice is yet to come and that the sports community is uh, not yet, not even close to being well aware of it. So there's a lot of work to do um, in that respect. Um, therefore, I, I hope that this conversation has also been useful to increase the, the knowledge that exists on the subject to other practitioners and even to athletes who might be listening to us. Uh, and another message I would, write, I would like to emphasize is that to me, integrating sports nutritionists, dietitians within teams and clubs is absolutely essential and these professionals should be widespread across all sports. Um, I'm saying this because obviously this is a cycling podcast and um, I'm not so sure what's the reality in other countries other than Portugal and the UK. But at least in Portugal, uh, there's still a long way to go in that respect uh, because most nutritionists are concentrated in soccer. And then only consulting privately at uh, clinics or to the general active population at uh, health clubs. But it's a bit harder for us to get to the athletes unless they are already motivated to come to us. So I believe there's a, a lot of work to um, develop there as well. And so I, I hope that in the near future, our profession will be given the right value and investment that in many cases it still doesn't have but it's worth uh, so we can also help prevent and efficiently treat conditions such as reds and eating disorders which have a much greater tool on the clubs and the, the national health systems even than we imagine 
Um, in relation to research that I would like to see performed in the next 10 years, um, in relation to RAD specifically, uh, I would like there to be more randomized controlled trials on matters regarding RADs because most of the information we have at, at present is from cross-sectional studies. Um, and personally, I'd particularly like to see more researching conducted on male athletes just in this particular subject uh, so we can increase our understanding of the consequences to their health and performance, um, at what point those potential impairments start to happen and being detectable, and what's the duration needed for low energy availability to actually induce these compromises. And also research to develop validated tools that help us uh, in practice to uh, actually diagnose the condition in a wider range of sport populations or even at an individual level, which I believe is already underway. So I'm confident uh, in these expectations. Some great wishes and in line with what some other guests who have been previously here on the podcast pointed out as well. And ladies, if people want to contact you or keep up with your social media interactions, where can people go to? Elena. So I am on Twitter at Elena Triguide and then a zero in the end. And people can also find me on Instagram at food at all. So that's where I share my insights on nutrition, food and all things related. In my case, you can find me also on Twitter at slash Rita Giro, as well as on LinkedIn, uh, where there's an hyphen <laughs> separating Rita from Giro, and on ResearchGate, uh, where there's an underscore <laughs> separating Rita from Giro. Uh, okay, it's, and that's uh, it. it's Rita Giro, like Giro d'Italia. I will, <laughs> I will put both uh, both these links to their respective social media on the show notes on com. And ladies, this has been an amazing hour sharing information about this. It really was a great idea to put you both together uh, and give this complimentary view on the subject. I truly love hearing you talk about this subject and you even made an effort to apply this to cycling as much as possible. So I do believe that there is some high quality information here that will surely be helpful to coaches and athletes and help raise awareness to this subject. For that, congratulations and thank you so much for your time, ladies. Thank you, Gabriel. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gabriel, and congratulations on the podcast. Congratulations. This is great. And that's it for today. Thank you so much for staying on that side until the end of the show. This was episode 27 with Elena Trigueiro and Rita Giro giving their insights on eating disorders and red ass. The episodes are going to keep on coming, so stay tuned and I'll be seeing you soon. Take care, everyone.